Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Let me welcome all of you to this side event entitled uh, Gender Equality in Peaceful Societies from Evidence to Action, which is part of an ongoing project entitled Women in Mediation and Peace Processes. Um, this project is co-organized by the International Peace Institute and the permanent mission of the Kingdom of Thailand in New York. The project has been initiated because we truly believe that women are agents of peace and agents of change, and that women can greatly contribute to peacemaking. The project and this side event is also timely, as this year marks the 15th anniversary of the adoption of Security Council Resolution 1325. And indeed, we are right now in the most crucial part of the year in this respect, that is the CSW week. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the equation of peace, there is a wide range of rivals. Today, we will be focusing on a specific one, that is gender equality. Empirical studies and the experience on the ground substantiate our shared belief that there can be no sustainable peace without the participation of women in global, regional, and national peace and political processes. To undertake this complex exercise today, it is our privilege to have four distinguished panelists who have extensive first-hand experiences through personal engagement in peace process in different parts of the world. They will be sharing with us their stories and their thoughts, particularly on the linkage between women's role, gender equality, and peace. Most importantly, they will try to answer those crucial questions that we have been asking ourselves, such as, where are we after the Beijing Plus 20 initiative and 15 years after the adoption of Resolution 1325. What are the lessons learned? How to improve the quality of women's participation? And how best can we enhance women's participation in resolving conflicts and building peace? I am indeed looking forward to an interesting and productive interactive discussion, which I am certain will provide valuable inputs for policy making and practical work in the field to further advance the role of women in the equation of peace. Before handing over the floor to the moderator, I would like to reiterate the Kingdom of Thailand's readiness and commitment to work with all stakeholders to ensure that the voices of women are heard and that the roles and contributions of women in the area of peace and security are fully recognized and enhanced. Thank you very much. Come up. Um, it's great to see such a full house here today and I'm just delighted that you've decided to take time out in this very, very busy week to come and join us for what I hope will be a lively and engaging discussion on the links between these two elements. We speak a lot about gender equality and, and connect that with peace, but what really is the evidence that underlies that connection? And how can we use that evidence to inform our action? And the panelists, as the ambassador rightly pointed out, have very rich experiences uh, making peace themselves at very high levels and also at very local levels. Uh, and also deep uh, research experience to bring us uh, the evidence base and the case behind this link that we so often speak about. So I'd like to just dive right in and start uh, by asking you, Valerie, about some of the evidence uh, that lies behind this link. So in your book, Sex and World Peace, which you have right there, you really lay out a, a very robust analysis of the links between gender equality and peaceful societies. So what does the evidence say about the relationship between equality, state security, and peace writ large? That's a wonderful question. And I'm, I'd like to first thank the organizers and the government of Thailand. I think this is a, a very needed discussion and very happy to see such a great turnout as well for this event. Um, I, I'd like to point out that um, it used to be 10, 15 years ago, that we didn't have the evidentiary base uh, to show how the treatment of women uh, cascaded outward into other aspects of, of state security. But that evidentiary base has grown and grown. And now we're able to 
to say with, uh, you know, in a, in a very strong and robust manner, if, if you want to talk about, say, food security, you're going to have to talk about women. Uh, because women are some of the primary food producers in the world. They are also responsible for children and whether they're nourished or malnourished. Um, whether we want to talk about demographics, of course we have to talk about women. What's been stunning is how we've managed to get away with talking about demographics and not talking about male-female relations within a society. Uh, if you want to talk about health, uh, there's plenty of evidence right, that shows that the overall general health, infectious disease burden, whatever, uh, of a nation is dependent upon the status and, and treatment of women. Um, and uh, what's fascinating about that research is that it shows that in societies where women are treated the worst, also has the worst <coughs> life expectancies for men, not just for women. Uh, and uh, economic prosperity, I, I'm sure you know that the World Bank has been very proactive in putting together a fantastic series of rigorous analyses that show that uh, women's subordinate status cripples the economic um, prosperity of nations. Uh, the, the larger the gender gap, the worse the rate of national economic growth and so forth. Uh, governance. Uh, uh, the international, the interparliamentary union and others have done some great research uh, showing what changes when, when women um, become a greater proportion of the decision makers in their society. And I think we've seen some very progressive and fascinating new moves, such as with companies uh, in, in Germany and Norway and so forth, in trying to bring in women's special decision making qualities. Uh, into the, the highest levels of national decision making. Now, my own research, which is referenced in this book, has tried to make a contribution in looking at uh, actual peacefulness of societies. Uh, and what we were able to demonstrate through our own data collection efforts and our analyses thereof is that um, the, the, the treatment of women, the physical security of women, is actually a better predictor of overall state relations with their neighbors, with the international community, and so forth, then measures such as democracy, to measures such as level of wealth, uh, regional variables, and so forth. Um, and, and I guess uh, if you step back, you'd have to say, well, of course, right? The two halves of human society, those that are responsible for the future of, of uh, humankind, all right. If relations between those two halves of society are oppressive and unequal, then how could the fate of the nation state be other? Thank you so much. It's really quite fascinating research that you've done. And I think, you know, this key message that societies that treat their women better are also more likely to be peaceful both internally in terms of crime and instability, but also externally in terms of their relations with their neighbors and with the international community. It's, it's a fascinating finding. And you know, the fact that the statistics actually back this up is, is quite telling. Um, I'd like to turn now to you, Madame Diop. Uh, your current role, of course, as AU Special Envoy for Women, Peace and Security has you uh, firmly sort of in the multilateral system, so to speak. But prior to this, I mean, you've had an entire career uh, leading women in peace processes and in peacemaking on the continent of Africa. And I'd like to ask you, you know, is there a particular story from all of your experience that kind of illustrates this link between gender equality and peace in, in practice? Really, I would like to thank um, IPI and uh, the organizers for inviting the African Union to be part of this conversation. I'm very glad to share um, the experience that we have within Africa. As you <coughs> rightly said, um, my life I have been at the service of women, peace and security in our continent. Um, I will start by saying that when you look into country like, uh, likely to fail and to get into conflict, you will see some of those indicators of bad governance, discrimination, inequality, um, and uh, um, the, my sister was just talk, giving the evidence. But uh, the discrimination against women, especially um, you know, the, 
non-participation and non-inclusion of women in uh, democratic process is one of the key indicators that we found on the ground. That's all of us who are in the field see that, you know, it's one of the, I will say it, I will not be shy away to say, one of the root cause of the conflict. So I have been involved in many crises where women were knocking the door and say that we wanted to come at the table, as you may know, um, when it's, uh, you know, the mediator call on uh, peace talks, you never see women being invited at the table. That's, and I always say that, why don't we put the mediator accountable? And I'm sure that uh, one of these meetings will make sure that we are asking the mediator in his terms of reference to be accountable as well, to make sure that he's looking for those who hold the guns, but also he's calling on women to come at the table. So we need to make that strong recommendation. So uh, when you take the issue of Burundi, and I'm very happy that Mr. Mahmoud is one of the panelists here, um, in the case of the peace talks in uh, Burundi, you remember that it was Nyerere and it was also Mandela who called on the meeting, uh, who was the two mediators, one after the other. But uh, I think that the talks ended and was successfully ended because the women came and knocked the door at the third round. And many of us went there to support the women of Burundi to say that we want the peace agreement now. Uh, and um, I think that is why Mandela was putting at the front the women for Burundi. And in the final agreement is one of the key agreements that we need to study, that the women were participating and their issues uh, were incorporated into that agreement. And the same thing that we did for the DRC, um, for the, the, the Sun City talk with Masire, it's when the women came in, that's where now they start talks, because they form the pressure group. I call them the women that are the army without the guns. They were putting pressure on them. You see that the case in Liberia with Lima Boy to say we are out, but we want you, we don't, we lock the door, and unless you sign the agreement, we will not relieve this door for you to get out. So that kind of pressure is what you see happening. They are not invited, but they have a lot to contribute. They have an agenda, they have experience, they are victims, they are survivors, they are resilient, but they have an agenda of human security. In my capacity as a special envoy, I visited recently, I visited um, Nigeria, the north of Nigeria. I met with the Shibok girls, those who escaped. What they tell me, one of them said to me, you know, I was taken away, I was raped, I escaped, but I'm here as a survivor. But Malala gave me hope because I want my education to continue. This is the reality on the ground. The, the body, the same way that the armed groups were using the body of the women in East Congo to do rapes, but the same way is happening right now with Boko Haram. I was in Somali uh, where we have Al Shabaab to look at the, 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 the impact also on those new phenomenon on the women in Africa, in our continent. But they're standing up. They are saying that we have to reconstruct our nation. They are the first one to reconcile. I went to um, also South Sudan. The only group that are reconciling right now in the camps of the UN are the women from the Nuer and from the Dinka. They are the ones that started this process to say, we want to reconcile. I was in Central Africa Republic with the director of UN Women, both of us, in a joint AU-UN mission. The Muslim and the Christian women are the only one talking now to say that we want to reconcile and to be the driving force for reconciliation. They always give hope. What we are saying is what they need is the kind of support they transform. I'm saying that the peace agreement will not be sustainable unless the women are sitting at the table 
in numbers, not just within the parties in the conflict, but they should come as civil society as they're carrying their human security agenda. That is the reality. Otherwise, it will fail in five years or 10 years, it will lapse, we have to come back. So the contribution of women are crucial in agreement of peace, but also they are crucial in accountability. Because at the end of the day, when they sign, they put it and ready to go on war the next day. What we want to do is to make sure that those agreements are implemented. And to do that, women have to be part of the process to make sure that they pursue those parties to make sure that they implement the agreement. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm so glad that you brought up peace processes in particular because Moving on to Irene next, Irene, you, you were a negotiator yourself for the government of the Philippines in the peace talks with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And I'm curious, you know, the Philippines is an outlier when it comes to women's participation in peace processes, because while the average uh, in, you know, up until 2011, at least the latest statistics that we have, on average, women were just 9% of peace negotiators, and the Philippines has actually reached 30% in some cases. And I'm curious, you know, we're talking about the links between gender equality in society at large and peacefulness of society. And do you think, is there something about attitudes towards women in broader Filipino society that allowed for this participation in peacemaking? <coughs> And just while, while we're getting the mic, uh, for those who don't know Irene's background, Irene started out as a leader in civil society, working for peace, and then transitioned, uh, was brought on as a negotiator for the government. So there's also this very interesting element of here when we think about how do women get a place at the peace table? How do they begin to participate in peace processes? You know, if, if you could touch on that too, what are the links between women's leadership and civil society? Do you think that when that is possible in a society, then it's also easier to get into the formal processes as well. Um, because I think there's an interesting element there. You know, some of the research findings that we're bringing out <coughs> here at IPI in a couple of months show that uh, the places where women are more likely to uh, sort of have meaningful participation in peace processes are those in which the women's movement within the society is, is, is quite strong already. So <coughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah, well, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, because I have something important to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I tell the story of how, how I, I got in, because those are the two important things. How do you get in? How do you stay in? And how, can you be, how will they take you seriously? Okay, so it's, it's really the discussion about participation, having a place at the table, but also to be taken seriously, so that you're not just a token woman. Um, well, uh, when the peace panel was formed, I was asked by the chairman if I would support him. I said, I am not supporting you. You know, you know I'm as good as you are, if not better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I, I, don't, I will not sit behind you, I will sit beside you. You make me a full member of your panel. And so, in a sense, I intimidated him. Because I said afterwards, heaven help you if you don't have a woman in your panel. So, but, you know, where does that kind of audacity come from? Uh, because it was audacious. That audacity comes from knowing you have women beside you and behind you. You don't go there, you know, it's just me. You know, there, I had a whole um, a background in organizing, in, in, in grassroots organizing for about 10 years. And he knew that. Uh, and it was in Muslim areas as well, so I knew the issues very well. So, so now, how did I stay in? Um, very, very fast. I learned that I was going to be marginalized if I was seen only as this gender expert. Mm. Uh, because a gender, expert, uh, gender is a soft issue, and it's not on the table. So why are you there? You know? and, you, and if you keep pointing out, oh, the gender provision needs to be like this, <laughs> nobody, they're, they're going to tune out after a while. So I said, okay, what's on the table, and what can I say about it? 
and and what and and I was very strategic. I chose what I thought was the, what could be the most strategic thing to focus on, um, and because peace agreements, peace negotiations take a long time, but the most strategic thing then is a ceasefire, and so that's where I focused. I became an expert on the ceasefire. So you want to talk about ceasefires? Talk to me. Uh, so they had to talk to me. Uh, and in, in fact, I became the, the point person. I became the point person of the committee, of the, of, of the peace negotiating <clears throat> panel on ceasefire. So I said, when, when, when the chairman said, uh, you seem to know a lot about ceasefires. I said, yeah, uh, would you be the point person for the panel? And I said, write that down and sign it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your person. So, so that, um, the details, the, the mechanisms, all of that, I worked really hard to make sure that that worked. And, and so only after that had happened did I become a valuable member of the panel. I got invited to secret meetings. So <coughs> when you get to go to secret meetings, you are important. Yeah, right. So, 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 but so, so, the, the, I, I'm just saying, uh, in, in in summary, that there are ways to get to get in. It's important what ways to get in. It's it's always like you have you have a movement behind you, mm -hmm. or there are people behind you, uh, and beside you, and 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 two that you have an expertise that is valuable to the the, the work at hand. Uh, I, I cannot emphasize enough this whole thing of being seen as value added. Uh, one more anecdote. Uh, in Libya, which <clears throat> is where we were restarting the talks, uh, the son of Gaddafi was already in the ceremonial room waiting for us to sign. And there was nothing to sign. So the men were running around. You know, I said, why are you running around? You know, because, he says, uh, the, there is a... There is a uh, provision that says that money from the Philippines government is going to go to development in the Bangsamoro areas. And I said, so what's your problem? And the problem is that they are not going to, why should we give them money and they will not be accountable? I said, how about this? How about saying, if government funds are used, then normal auditing procedures shall apply. Ha, huh, yes, okay. <laughs> so the value added also was mm. drafting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's what the work of the peace negotiation is like. It's drafting. Mm. And, and, and I, worked, uh, I, was, I worked in the UN for a while, so I knew about drafting. So, so the, the idea is really that you are value added, you're relevant, you're, you bring in your gender perspective within those things that are uh, that are discussed by the by the negotiating panel, but don't stop there. You know, you get in, but you don't stop there. Then you bring the, your gender issues. Mm -hmm. Now you they will listen to you. So mm -hmm. this is the, the the my whole thing about uh, participation uh, to influence. Thank you. So I, I'd like to turn now to the Middle East. We've heard some incredible stories from Africa and Asia, Yusuf. I'm curious, how does all of this apply to the Middle East today, in, in your view? You know, what, in particular, when it comes to violent extremism, what role does gender equality play in countering <coughs> violent extremism? Thank you for inviting me. Marie wanted to challenge me. I've been preaching, engaging men in the gender narrative. So said, here is a test for you. So if I fumble, You'll understand I am here under duress. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, just to situate the gender narrative. So Article 1 says, All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and confidence and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. So that's Article 1. Quickly, Article 16. It has three subparagraphs. I'll just read the last one because it's most relevant. Article 16 says, the family 
is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. In times of national stress, whether it is a revolution, a conflict, an uprising, you name it, the gender agenda swings between these two elements. As you know, during strife and conflict, women leadership, women are thrust in the leadership position. The minute things start settling, guess what? They are part of the family, and therefore the family becomes far more important. So in my country, women were smart. Um, so they went back and they <coughs> said, okay, the starting point is the family. And men cannot compete in many areas where it comes to family. So they said, okay, we are going to educate head of household family and become experts in the interpretation of Quran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know not how to counter violent extremism. The women in my country, Tunisia, they think that's a men's narrative but how to prevent counter-terrorism. That's a woman narrative. And so under pressure, the government of Morocco and the government of Algeria created a special program to train women imams mm -hmm. that know by heart the Quran and know how to interpret and we have seen many debates where men, this exeget, you know, the, the, the specialist, and women arguing and giving different interpretation. And in um, uh, Algeria, as you know, has had its own sad and violent history of extremism mm. where Algerians killing other Algerians in the name of Islam, they've created a, an, a spiritual army. Mm -hmm. It's called Al-Murshidat, spiritual guides. It's about 300 of them. That they were trained in psychology, they were trained in, and of course, all of them. And they are the first uh, call of women who have seen their youngsters boys and girls flocking to the various extremist movements. And they are doing a, a fabulous job. One last mm. thing. Under the pressure of these women who took their individual rights um, in part of the family, um, they pushed uh, last week lobbying the Algerian president and the parliament, and Algeria for the first time voted a law that penalizes violence against women in the family up to 20 years of jail. Of course, you can imagine who didn't vote for it, but the majority recognized that peace becomes and starts at home. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. So I'm very aware that obviously this week we are having this wonderful celebration of 20 years uh, since Beijing, the, you know, the conference that really laid the gauntlet for uh, progress on, on women's empowerment. And so I'd, I'd, I'd also like to explore with uh, everyone that's here, you know, what progress has been made and, and what we should be focusing on as, as we look to the future. So Valerie, I wonder if I could come back to you and ask you, what does the research and the evidence show about what works and what doesn't work when it comes to changing policy and practice at the intersection of women's security and peace? That's a terrific question. And uh, it's, I think, one of the most vitally important questions that we could attempt to answer. Uh, at, at a meeting such as the Beijing Plus 20 uh, meetings here today. Um, 
One of the key elements, and I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone who's familiar with my work, is that we need data. Okay? Um, I myself have been involved over the last 15 years in compiling the largest database uh, on the situation of women worldwide, uh, women stats, if you're not familiar with it. We have uh, data on over 360 variables uh, for 175 countries, and it is all freely accessible online. In addition, we take our data and actually make innovative scales that allow researchers to use statistical methods to analyze the situation of women and its, uh, its covariates. So data is hugely important. I think it's also important to begin uh, an analysis uh, of, of what works and what doesn't work. I mean, I think the, the, the threat is, the risk is, that uh, a nod to women becomes an obligatory box to check right, during the great speeches. But then in terms of what happens after the great speeches are over, uh, what's happening? Um, <clears throat> so for example, um, is it easily accessible to know what the, the gender makeup of uh, UN negotiating teams, UN mediation teams, and so on is? No, it's hard to find that data. What we'd like to do is to get that data and present it in graphic form so that you can see exactly what um, the shortcomings are, the uh, disconnect between the high-level statements and what happens uh, at the ground. Um, another element that I've become convinced is extremely important is that for women, we need a pincer movement. We need top-down and we need bottom-up to be working simultaneously, even if they're not working in concert. On the top-down level, laws matter. Um, I think some of you have been to the Equality Now events, which have tried to create a compendium of discriminatory laws against women worldwide. This is hugely important work, hugely important work. Uh, and the strategic litigation to try to, to um, uh, overcome some of those uh, legal discriminations is extremely important. Um, one of the things that we lack, which I think would be terrific, is as uh, Dr. Mahmoud was just talking about what Algeria did in terms of increasing penalties for violence against women, there is no central repository of uh, current legislation and pending legislation um, that concerns women. But that's the kind of data that we need uh, in, in order to take targeted action. Uh, another area that I've become, uh, again, personally convinced is to, to reach the next generation and to reach them at those very sensitive ages of between 10 and 14 uh, with programs that ask boys and girls, in a sense, to reconsider who each other are, right? What does it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to be a girl? Boys have dreams for who they want to be someday. Is it okay for girls to have dreams about who they want to be someday? So the next generation at this formative stage, I think, is, is extremely important. And last but not least, um, I'd like to talk about the recognition factor. Um, one of my uh, colleagues and former students uh, has co-written a book called The Silent Sex. Uh, in which they study decision-making uh, in groups that are all male and then mixed gender. Uh, and, and what they discover is that um, for some reason, and they don't go into an explanation of what the, the reasons might be, is it is often difficult for men to see women <coughs> and to hear women. Uh, and that... Um, it, what uh, turns out to be extremely important is men showing men, other men in the room, that they see women and hear women. Uh, and I saw this play out in a department meeting at which this scholar um, was attending. Um, and we talked about it later, and I, and, and I was so deeply impressed. When a woman raises a point, and I think some of you will uh, uh, sympathize with this, all right, she says her bit. Five, ten minutes later, 
A man raises the same point, and the other men in the room say, you know, Stan brought up a really good point here that we should consider. <laughs> so what he tries to do strategically is when a woman brings up one of these points that's about to, you know, then fade into total insignificance, he goes, you know, Jessica just brought up a very important point here. By saying only that, even if he says only that, by saying her name and pointing out that she said something significant, the other men in the room actually say, I think I missed what Jessica said. What did she say? All right? Mm. They hear. So the critical importance of men and the critical importance of simple recognition. Okay, simple recognition. And I, I think that we've seen this um, where um, some peace negotiations include civil society actors, include women, photo opportunities with them, recognizing their importance, um, and others don't as if those women do not exist, okay? So the politics and the diplomacy of recognition, I think, is something that could be very, very meaningful at the, the ground level. Uh, so this kind of analysis is important. And, and you know, uh, we've tried to look at these things in a broader sense. Uh, if you're interested, my next book that's coming out this summer is called The Hillary Doctrine, which looks at how uh, um, Hillary Clinton and American foreign policy did or did not empower women um, over the last several years. So those kinds of analyses based on data are crucial to moving us past the bromides, okay, which then become just a box to be checked. Thank you. Thank you. And it's uh, just, it's great to hear you mention, you know, the importance, uh, the important role of men. And it's wonderful to see so many men in the audience today. I applaud you for coming and thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I think this book, uh, the, the Silent Sex, is also some very interesting findings that, you know, we can link or could link quite interestingly with peace processes and how many women get to participate, you know, and we often hear this idea of, oh, there was just a token woman. And their very interesting findings show that actually the number of women that are, when there is a meeting and something is being decided, and this is obviously in a slightly different context, but, you know, could be relatable, that when it's a very small number of women in the room, the women are much less likely to speak up and they're much more likely to be shot down, so to speak, by the men. And when there are greater numbers of women in the room, they're more likely to speak up and the men are more likely to be open to their contributions and even encourage them. So th this kind of uh, you know, very robust research that is being done already in some other fields, such as in, in the field of negotiation, um, and uh, psychology and behavioral psychology, I think could have some very interesting findings as well if brought over into this realm of peace and security. But I'd like to move on now to your idea of the, the pincer and kind of approaching it from the top down and the bottom up. And we need the evidence and we need the policy frameworks, but we also really need that bottom up action. And so Irene, I'd like to turn to you on that front because you know, again, coming back to Beijing, you were the executive director of the NGO Forum at Beijing in 1995. And I'd like to ask you, sort of 20 years on, how can we renew the, the global women's movement? Um, the, reason, the reason Beijing was so su successful, you know, it led to a progressive uh, platform for action, uh, was, that, was that there was really a very strong participation from civil society, from women's groups. Um, we in the NGO Forum decided that every regional governmental conference would have a parallel NGO Forum. So, so we, we, had, we, we, we wanted to make sure that international meant interregional. You know, because sometimes you're just floating there international without any roots in the regions. And, and it's really the women's voices can be heard better, I think, and, uh, in, on that regional level, if not the national level. So, so we made sure that that was a process. So by the time we got to Beijing, we had a very, very strong women's movement. So by the time we, we, we formed uh, a team called Equipo, uh, which was the lobbying team, that lobbying team had gone from 
the various regions. So that, that I think, is a, is a good lesson on how you, you get uh, influential and how, how you get your agenda uh, out there. Um, and then what happened? You know, what happened to that 20 years ago? Um, I, I always say that there are uh, three barriers to women's full enjoyment of their rights and, and their full participation. And, and there are, these are conceptual, technical, and political barriers. The conceptual barrier is that we, we, we accept whatever is the concept that has been given to us. And we sort of tweak and we play around that, that concept. So the, <clears throat> in, on, in, the, in the case of peace negotiations, the peace negotiation is about ending war. That's the concept. So if it's about ending war, then only the war actors are around the table. You have no say. Mm. You're not a war actor. You don't have any. Mm. You, you cannot participate. So, so I've been working on expanding that concept mm -hmm. so that it's not just ending war, it's building peace. Mm -hmm. Now, if, it is, if, if, if the concept is expanded, do women have a chance? Yes, women have a chance. Okay, so the conceptual part. The second part is the technical part. And most of the work, most of the so-called projects, which I call small islands of peace and happiness, uh, are, are really just, you know, capacity building there, another capacity building there, and yeah, yes, what happened? Because we got caught in gender mainstreaming. We thought gender mainstreaming was the answer. And the side stream, we were side streamed by gender <laughs> mainstreaming. We were, you know, the, 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 the technical people came up, the people, the activists, you know, went to the sides and said, okay, the technical people are there already doing the gender mainstreaming, and then nothing. You do not get the influence that you need to make because you don't <clears throat> have a movement. So the third barrier is the political barrier, and that's what I'm saying. We need to keep the movement, and a strong movement to continue uh, that's why when they say, uh, let's commemorate Beijing plus 20. No, we continue <laughs> Beijing plus 20, because that was what we had at that time. Uh, that, so the, the, to me, uh, there's, there's a very strong research, uh, 70 countries, four generations, uh, uh, how to effectively end uh, violence against women. And it said, it's not, it's, it's not the economic wealth of a nation, it's not the presence of many women in government. It's not the, the presence of political parties, progressive political parties. It is the presence of a strong, independent, feminist movement. That's what we need to have in order, whatever, <coughs> whatever is the problem that we're talking about now, we need to continue you know, <clears throat> our work in having that strong, independent, feminist movement. So in, I, I've just come from Australia where I spoke in a different city every day for five days. And, and I challenged the young women and the young men. <clears throat> I said, my generation had three words. You know, it was difficult to put them together. Personal is political. Three words, but they changed a lot of things. Now they change domestic violence. It's not a private issue. It's a public issue. It's a public crime. So I challenge everyone here, what are your three words? Three only, not four. I just want three words because it has to have, it has to be powerful. It has to have impact. Okay? And then, only then, so this, this independent, strong independent feminist movement must be directed towards women being taken seriously. Because that's what, no, all the capacity building in the world is not going to make us be, ta be taken seriously, right? So, so when you ask me now about Beijing, uh, the relationship of Beijing to now, I, I take this t-shirt, okay? And this is shameless advertising because you can, <laughs> you, because you can buy this outside. Um, so it says here, uh, and I will stand up. 20 years ago, we looked at the world through women's eyes. We looked at the world through women's eyes. Now, we must take women seriously. 
Okay, Thank so you, no Irene. more looking at the world through women's eyes. We must take women seriously. Okay, take women seriously. Those are your three words, I'm guessing. <laughs> Good. Great. So I, I, I am conscious of the time, and we're going to move to Q&A next. Uh, so do get your questions ready. And I do have two more questions for each of our remaining panelists. I just ask you to maybe keep it a, a little bit more brief so that we can give the audience a chance to engage with us. But I, I am curious, Binto, you know, we just heard about the role of the women's <coughs> movement and building it up from below. I, I, and I'd like to turn to you now and ask kind of about the next 20 years, the 20 years to come. And what, what should the role of, of international organizations like the UN and, and the African Union do to accelerate women's participation and build peaceful societies over the next 20 years? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, in our continent, Africa, we see this opportunity of uh, the Beijing, but also our 50 years of our independence um, to build the 50-year vision, the Africa we want, 2063, but also to look into how do we silence the gun um, in the 2020. Those have been the debate at the grassroots level, at uh, all levels, to come with a vision for Africa. Uh, when we look at the issue of women, peace and security, we say that there are many national action plans mm -hmm. now. What about an even regional action plan? The key issues is the implementation. Government are not implementing. They adopt beautifully. So how do we make sure that they implement? How do we meet the silencing the gun by 2020? if the women are not participating in all the process. We say that there are solutions. If we look at solutions in each areas, for example, of 1325, either it is on participation, you rightly see it. She was a great mediator herself. It's happened. We need to document that and make sure that everywhere we say it can be done. We came to look at leadership of mediation like somebody like Mary Robinson, how she did it to put in front of the Great Lakes the framework, the, the hope. It's possible as well that you put women at the forefront. So there are some success stories. When it comes to prevention, for example, I take my country and I see what uh, the group like uh, Pharma Fix Solidarity and others have done to make sure that they mobilize in the women's situation room, to prevent the conflict in election that we see happening. It's, it's, we can do it. We can do it. It's possible. The women of Liberia, others, it's possible. So what African Union is going to do is that I have been mandated to design with the grassroots women, the women that we mobilize a framework for implementation, with clear indicators, as we said, but also budget, because we tend to design those plan of action, and we tend to go and look for partners to come and implement this for us. That is not reality. We need to look at how our own budget address the issue of implementation. So within the African Union, my mandate now is to make sure that we have a framework for implementation, mm. which we think that we'll review and publishing annual report, but looking concrete solutions. Because if we say it's possible, let's look what happened in Rwanda on certain areas. Let's look what happened in Senegal, what is happening in Liberia and other places where we have success stories. And make sure that we document them and we make sure that we implement them wherever it is possible. So I see that in the 20 years to come, women can uh, make tremendous uh, contribution more recognized. And um, I ask uh, IPI to continue also to document these stories. This is strong. Um, I very much want, you know, like our sister saying, the indicators are very key the data collection, <clears throat> but writing the stories of the women and to say it's possible and push our member state 
to make sure that they implement the agenda of women, peace and security. Thank you. Well, we would be delighted to continue doing some of that documentation. And I think I, I hear four words coming here from Binta. We can do it. Do, do four words count, Irene. So, Yusuf, I'd like to just finally turn to you and quite briefly ask you to talk about the contributions that men can make to all of this, and especially in, in very patriarchal societies. How can they be convinced of the value of empowering women for the greater good of society itself? One uh, starting point is for IPI to repeat performance of this particular event with the same title, but add only young men admitted. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no women. When I look at the rooms, about 80. I mm. counted 10. I only now count six. I don't know what happened to the other four. <laughs> the reason I, I say this is because there are two huge current that will affect all of us, men and women. Um, particularly in Africa and the Middle East, where I come uh, from. One is the story that we hear, namely, more and more girls are attracted to ISIL. More and more girls are being the battleground for all mm. kinds of ideologies. Mm. In order to weaken society, guess what Boko Haram target? Mm. Okay. I don't see why, I can't imagine why any man would be indifferent to this. In Tunisia, we have 3,000 fighters with ISIL. It's a small country of 11 million, 3,000. So the men are realizing it's my daughter as well. It's not just mm -hmm. my wife's problem. It's my problem as well. So that was its beginning. Um, a, a second um, trend um, that is positive but needs to be capitalized upon by men and women is the sweeping changes in the way governance is being carried out. Mm -hmm. so men have realized that that particular change that is taking place would not have been possible without men and women being together. Whether it's the latest event in Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. the ongoing events as we speak in Burundi, where the president want, uh, sort of treats the constitution as a perishable document to be doctored, uh, so he can stay a third term. Mm. Or in my own country, where men have realized no change without women. And guess what? Women are asking for payback time in my own country. So two examples of how women, men realize that the world has changed and we can no longer ignore 51%. Mm -hmm. And they are realizing that a world, in a world where 51% are ignored, is a dangerous world for everyone. So men have championed two, in my own country, two major um, initiatives. One is to push and integrate in the new constitution very strong language about the role of the state in taking necessary measures to eliminate all forms of violence against women. Mm -hmm. You know where that comes from. Second, the men that led the succeeding government insisted and convinced other patriarchal parties to formally withdraw the various reservations against CEDAW. Mm -hmm. And it is now formal, and guess what? Men are proud. Now, there is a danger. There is a danger, there is a fear that once these men, and particularly, and women, but men, are in power, they are going to feminize state structures and states. So in, in search of 
ex exogenous legitimacy, they're going to champion how much they have championed for women. But actually, it's not for women. It's for them to, to show how liberal they are and, and unfortunately capitalize on it, not always for the right. Mm -hmm. So uh, women who are educated, and by the way, speaking of education, mm -hmm. are very vigilant mm -hmm. to ensure that the feminization of state security does not you know, um, become a fashionable uh, again. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Well, thank you all for your incredible contributions. I'd like to open it up now to questions from the floor. And I'd like to start with a very special guest who we have sitting here in the front row today. Uh, and, and her name is Dr. Saisuri Chutikul. And she has come in from Thailand, where she has had an incredible career uh, leading the way for women, working on violence against women and many other issues, uh, both domestically but also on the international stage, uh, where she was also a leader in the Committee on the Elimination of, the Discrimina of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, which we know it better as. So I'd, I'd like to ask now Dr. Saisuri to just open the floor uh, with a first question of her own. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, thank you all the distinguished panelists for giving such rich information, uh, motivational talk, exciting, very inspiring. It's so inspiring that above my head there are electric bulbs flashing all over. <laughs> uh, as, as a person who is trying to do something, the National Plan for Action on this uh, topic, very topic uh, for Thailand. And uh, uh, because uh, now you said question, uh, it, it's a it's a single. I I I, I cannot can, say anything single. No, it, th this one comes can, can in threes, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The thing is, uh, a couple of points I would like to make. I, I have to say that I'm a freshman to this uh, arena. Uh, first of all, I agree that research and knowledge building has has to come uh, further. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, Madame uh, Hudson that uh, you, you know you asked, you raised so many questions about information that you need more. And I also, as I was, you know, going through my papers and things, I like to, you know, what I like to see is that you document all the women like Madame Diop and you know. I don't need just women. I, I don't want to leave Dr. Mahmoud out. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I try to concentrate on women for now. Uh, is that those who have been participating internationally, you know, with the UN missions and so on, what happened to them? How, do, how did they feel about themselves? How did they feel about what they have found in the field you know, I mean, there's a slew of questions that I like to ask, and that would be very good to document uh, for, for, for us uh, uh, to follow and, and to consider. Uh, and that would be a good lesson for the four, 10 to 14 years old you were talking about uh, as well. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, I would say that uh, a capacity building of all the people, in particularly uh, women and young girls and young men, uh, necessary. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about other countries. Can I say this with my permission from my ambassador? That I'm going to say something about Thailand. That at one time, the state security and women don't mix. In fact, when they talk about state security, they said the women are the one that you don't trust. Mm -hmm. Particularly the Thai men who marry to foreign women, and vice versa, where the Thai women married to foreigners. Mm -hmm. You know, you have certain kind of discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, not only against the, uh, the gender, the sex, but also, you know, the nationalities. So, um, come back to that, is that uh, uh, we need to, to do more about uh, the concept of state security and the gender role and the gender equality. Uh, another point that I would like to ask is that when you go to work with the women's group uh, in the field, uh, I was excited. So it, it's so exciting to hear about what happened in Africa. Uh, what, that, what happened after 
the, the, the peace has come about, or comparatively speaking, the peace has come about. What happened to these women? Do they, as you said, you go back to the family, or do you retain your activism uh, towards the, you know, the national uh, 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 level of, of work of peace? And uh, my last point is that uh, the NGO, NGOs, I know Irene Santiago uh, from Beijing, uh, we grow old together because that has been 20 years past. Uh, I was just wondering how most of the states consider the role of NGOs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those wonderful reflections and questions. I think that's a very rich contribution that spans, again, all of the different areas that we need to focus in on this, right from the evidence and the documentation of real women leading the way, uh, you know, to some of the other policy elements and, and, and the NGO elements and the bottom-up elements too. And just on the documentation side, just to mention that we here at IPI, my colleague Andrea Sullivan and I have been doing a series called the Women Peacemaker Series, which is interviews with women peacemakers from around the world. On uh, You can find them on IPI's Global Observatory website. Uh, so if anyone is interested in hearing more of these kinds of stories, you can certainly go there. So just keep those questions in mind, my dear panelists. And I'd now like to open it up to the floor. And we'll take three questions at a time. Uh, and if you could just wait for the microphone to come to you and just say your name and affiliation and keep it quite brief. And we'll start here with Anne Phillips. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Anne Phillips, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Peace Institute. And I, too, want to thank you all so much for being here today and sharing your, sharing your observations and your experiences and your research with us. And I must tell you that uh, uh, there were many times when I identified very much with what each of you had to say. Um, I, uh, I'm going to direct my question to Yusuf Mahmoud. Um, I was fascinated to hear about this ex experiment, or I don't know what you want to call it, uh, this approach toward, with women becoming the experts on the Quran and becoming characterized as imams. And I guess I don't know how long this has been going on. I assume it's quite recent. So it must be too, really, uh, too soon to judge whether the children growing up in these households where the mother is this expert and appreciated <clears throat> as such by the general public, whether that has had an impact on how the children's attitude, particularly young boys, I think young girls would identify with the mothers anyhow, but young boys and young men, whether this will ch has changed or will change their attitudes towards women and the dynamics between men and women in the future generation. Um, I think this is really very exciting, and I think it would be fascinating to be able to follow this with the young men growing up in a household like this. And again, thank you all very much for being here, and thank you so much for your observations and your input, too. Thank you. Okay, we'll take another question. I see uh, here in the center. Yes, thank you. Bonjour tout le monde, je vous remercie. Je vais parler en français et j'ai essayé de me débrouiller okay. et de me faire aider par une interprète pour comprendre ce qui est en train de se dire. Bien. Ça va. Donc je vais pas poser la question en français, peut-être qu'elle pourrait euh, après traduire. OK, so someone's going to translate the question into English in, in one minute. So please go ahead. OK. Donc euh, pour moi, euh, je remercie d'abord euh, madame Binte Diop et son organisation qui soutiennent notre organisation qui se trouve en Casamance. C'est un conflit dont on ne parle pas assez. Ça se trouve dans le sud du Sénégal. Il y a un conflit qui dure depuis 1982. Et depuis donc, 2010, les femmes se sont réunies aujourd'hui en une grande plateforme et sont en train d'essayer justement d'influencer les négociations. Et nous avons produit un document pour le donner effectivement aux deux parties si nous ne pouvons pas accéder jusqu'à la table de négociation. Et il y a une chose que j'ai apprise ici, c'est pour ça que je voulais dire cette appréciation qui a été dite tout à l'heure ici, qu'on ne va pas seulement à la table pour mettre fin à la guerre, mais on va à la table pour construire une société de paix. Et là, les femmes ont une place. Et je pense que c'est un argument extrêmement important que j'ai fait mien et que je vais utiliser effectivement pour réclamer ma place. 
Merci bien. Est-ce qu'on pourrait avoir la traduction Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to respond especially to Madame Diop and, and thank all of you for being here and speak a word out of my uh, country where I'm coming from in Senegal, in the south of Senegal, working in a peace platform of women's organizations, working together, knowing that the presence of women at the negotiation table is one of our demands. And something very important that I heard in what was said here today is that we don't go to the negotiation table to talk about ending the war, but to go to build peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll take one more question now, just behind. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica Zimmerman. I work at the, gender, the Consortium on Gender Security and Human Rights. Um, and I'd like to echo everyone's thanks to the organizers, IPI, as well as the panelists. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more on perspectives on gender quotas. Um, and I'm being a little, deliberately, a little bit polemical here, um, but, but I feel like this would be a very enriching, it would add to the enriching discussion that we've already had. Um, and I bring up gender quotas because most, it's often brought up as a very important tool as a first step to women's participation. Um, <clears throat> and what I found, I, I worked for several years on engaging women parliamentarians in South Asia, um, in countries that have gender quotas, and I think um, on the one hand, they're very effective in certain measures in granting access uh, as entry points, creation of role models, um, all of these very positive things. But on the other hand, um, and what I believe some of the panelists has touched upon is that when you're sitting in a, in a seat that's reserved for a woman, there's this credibility issue. Um, and what I'd found with um, a number of women's leadership was this reluctance to discuss women's issues, anything that would be constrained, construed as soft. Um, so often there'd be um, somewhat of a tendency to take harder lines and more militant approaches. Um, and that's confounded with the problem with, you know, in electoral systems, there is, um, uh, it's the people who have the means to run effective campaigns so in countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's not often women who are representing women's interests, but perhaps the interests of, say, warlords and um, ethnic uh, minority elites. So gender quotas is something that I, I'm personally a bit ambivalent about, and I'd be really, really <coughs> interested to hear the Fantastic. panelists' perspectives. We'll put that to the panel. Thank you, Thank Jessica. You. OK, so I'd like to turn back to the panel now. And I'd like to start with you, Yusuf. You had a particular question about uh, the children in, in these households with the women imams, and also if you'd like to reflect on anything that Dr. Saisuri brought to the table. Maybe I'll start with Anne's uh, question. In Morocco, actually, it started in 2005 after the Casablanca bombing, if you remember, of 2003. And they found out that a number of these young people went to the wrong mosques. And it was basically a male interpretation of a radical interpretation of Islam. So since 2005, that number of women that were trained to be not imams, but spiritual guides, they moved from 50 to 50,000 since 2005. Some people, although I have not seen evidence, say that one of the reasons there aren't as many uh, coming from Morocco to ISIL and other is perhaps to a certain, but it's more a, 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 a perceptive rather than a study uh, that you know, there aren't many women and young men from Morocco joining um, ISIL. Um, and that ISIL, as it moves now and metastasizes to North Africa, again, anecdotal evidence say it will have a harder time in Morocco than in Tunisia. In Algeria, it started much earlier, in the 1990s, actually. Um, the number has not grown as dramatically as in Morocco. But Morocco, as you know, has been seized as this, one of the spiritual uh, founders uh, of the progressive, uh, tolerant Islamic uh, tradition. So that is on the issue of, uh, of quota. And, um, and uh, in, in my country, women had a slogan, um, uh, basically, uh, gender, um, 
gender quotas are a favor, gender equality is a right. And they made it very clear that they are not asking uh, for a favor. And they pushed and they got with some men champion gender parity in electoral list. So if the top person is a woman, rarely, let me, let me quickly add, the second must be a man and vice versa. Um, and this has been with the um, push of men and women enshrined in the new constitution, gender uh, parity. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to turn to you now, Madam Diop, uh, if I may. And I know Dr. Sizer mentioned something interesting about what happened to the women afterwards. Do they go back to their family? But we, we also had a question on, on the situation in southern Senegal. But I'll, I'll leave it to you now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, congratulate our sisters in uh, Kazamas. I'm from Senegal. And um, we know that um, uh, that conflict has been there for a long time. And um, some of our organization are supporting them, as you said. But the women are doing it, and they're using a lot of uh, traditional mechanism also. You know, the women of the Bois Sacre are known um, because they play a role on encouraging the soldiers, but they play a role also to ask them to come back. So we congratulate the women by, by, by doing, the, you know, the, I think the penetrating the religious, but also the traditional, as you say, spheres by the women themselves, you know, create um, also by being the leaders in those communities, religious, traditional, and so on, and make sure that they have been heard, not just at the t table of negotiation. And I think this is what the women of Kadamas are also doing to, to dismantle um, those, those arena um, of, of the structure of security um, done by the men. Um, coming to the issues that um, we have been asked, um, most of the time, as you know, women push to be at the table and women push to make sure that there is an agreement, either it is a ceasefire, but either it is a, a peace building. But at the end of the day, they go back because when it comes to sharing the cake, uh, we don't see them because the men are the one who at the end of the day, um, you know, share the cake, which is the power because that's the issues why they took the gun, is the sharing of the power. And at the end of the day, they will be again going and looking at it. That's why it is not sustainable. And it make me the link of the gender parity, the gender quota. Because what we need to do in the, in the um, drafting of the new constitution, starting from the peace agreement, we need to have that um, parity or the equality of women and men in any new uh, governance mechanism. And, and it's not a favor. It's, it's a right for the women to participate, not just to pick up the pieces and to reconstruct, but we be in the power because it's a failure of the power of the governance mechanism of the human right and so on that have made those countries feel, the, as we have said, be in the failed state. In the reconstruction, mm -hmm. women have to be at the forefront. We have seen many countries in Africa that have done positive in terms of uh, Rwanda, for example, 60% of women. Um, and thank to this, uh, the issue of quota. But it's not an end by itself. For me, the quota is just uh, to make sure that we look at the glass ceiling and uh, we show that women can make it, not just uh, one woman or two, but the numbers of women can make it, can transform, can bring the agenda, as you said, can open the, you have to open the door, have a strategy, be there, but after to be relevant. And uh, countries like uh, my country in Senegal after the crisis, we have the parity principle, which have now more than 40% of women in our parliament because we adopt the parity principle within the political parties, one woman, the zebra, one woman, one man, one. Unfortunately, it doesn't lead to the, 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 the equality of 50-50, but because they will put one man first and one woman second. But at the end of the day, it brings a number of women, um, and we have in Senegal, for example, more than 40% of women. But we, we need to demand, to continue to demand. And um, the peace movement, as was said, you need the movement to continue. 
because it's not it's not the men sitting there who will leave their seat and let us for us. So we need to mobilize. And I think the women peace movement should continue. In Africa, there is strong women peace movement. Uh, when it happened, when crisis is there, we are looking more into prevention. How do we make sure that before having early warning where women can mobilize and we don't wait until the conflict and the violent conflict is there to come up and say we want peace. So those are some of the things that is happening and we want to link to continue to link with the international community, with the women at the global, like through the Beijing process, and make sure that we have this movement to continue to demand for our rights. Thank you. Valerie, would you like to reflect yeah, on I'd, anything? I'd like <clears throat> to say a word about gender quotas. And I'm now old and you are young. And let me give you some perspective. That always happens in the first wave, right? It always happens when women are the minority, they're the chosen token, they're the favor that's been given by men to women, right? And, and women think they have to outdo the men, right? In order to be taken seriously. So I see, you see all the themes being interwoven here. But it's not that first generation you're doing it for. It's the second and third generation who have grown up now seeing, right, equal visibility. Now they have dreams about when they become a legislator, what they would do. It's that second and third generation where you begin to get what I would consider to be authentic women's voices, authentic women's mobilization and solidarity and confidence. But how do you get the second generation unless there's been a first? Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do it. So um, I agree though, the attitude should be, you're not giving me this as a favor that you can then withdraw at some point, right? This is our right. We are 50% of the population. We are the mothers of every person in this country, right? We need to be there. Mm. Thank I you, Valerie. Um, yes, you want to say I, something? I else? just wanted to add on that because uh, we are focusing most of the time on the issues of the power, the structure of power. But uh, we also have to look into the economic, especially the resources, the finances, where we are in our continent, Africa, we have a lot of resources which are part of our conflict as well. So what we are trying to say, for example, a country like uh, uh, Kenya have a quota in terms of the uh, procurement of the government for the women. So you, if women can apply, uh, the entrepreneur, to make sure that they have 30% of the procurement of the state um, so they can buy it as many. And we see the emergence of women entrepreneur and women leadership in the economic side. So we need not just to look into the power structure, but also the resources, access to our natural resources, access to our financial resources as well. Thank you. Irene? Um, Saisori's uh, question on... Um, NGOs and the state, uh, NGOs and the UN, I think is more relevant uh, this week. Uh, many of us are really dismayed by the document that's going to come out of the Commission on Status of Women. It is not what, it, I think it, it really is a disappointment for many of us who worked so hard to have a very progressive Beijing Platform for Action. And, and I look around. I mean, I, I organized, when, when I was executive director of the NGO Forum, I was asked to organize two international consultations of this kind, you know, all, this, all the different workshops. Um, and, but I noticed then that we were inside. We were part of what was going on in there. And then I come here 20 years later, and, and the women and the NGOs are outside. And so, so where is that where is that interaction now between civil society, the women's organizations, and what's going on in there? Uh, so, so I think that is a very serious problem. Um, but then I, again, I see that why are we focusing? <laughs> Sorry, this is going to be very subversive. Um, why are we focusing on the United Nations as the locus of change? 
-hmm. of social mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. To me, it is yeah. not. Yeah. It is yeah. not yeah. the law. I mean, it is to me, it is uh, an important audience, and even call it just an audience. It is important, mm -hmm. but it is not the, lo the locus of social change. So if we want to have the social change, I'm, I'm thinking of something like, let us form the global civic networks Citizen. that we need to bring about mm -hmm. the social, political, and economic changes that we need. And women will have to be in the forefront of that mm -hmm. because we see that it hasn't worked. So let's not tweak here, there, you know, and it doesn't work. It will not work. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why uh, the, the the women's uh, uh, seriously campaign is going to work through women's peace tables all over the world. Women's peace tables, and each peace table is going to say, "This is what we denounce, but this is what we will announce." In other words, what is this new world we want to be in? It's a new world, especially for young people. Social media is there. All of, these were things that were not there 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we were using fax, fax machines. You know, email wasn't even there. Okay, it's a different world. We can't go on doing the same things we were doing. That's why when she said, "Okay, what do I really feel about NGOs and the and the UN? And should I focus my attention there?" I don't think so. You know, so 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 this is what I'm thinking. I, let's 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 see whether women's life experiences, which are different from men, can in fact um, re envision in or envision a new world and bring our men and our our children with us into that new world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. And what a beautiful note to, to end this on, our vision for the future, and let's think about what that is. I'm, I'm afraid we are out of time, so we won't be able to take any more questions for now, but I do hope uh, that you'll come back again to the next IPI event, and we'll certainly we look forward to staying in touch with you and bringing you more wonderful people and interesting research on this topic. So thank you all for coming, and thank you so much to our panelists to the uh, Thai mission to the UN and to Dr. Saizuri and the ambassador. We're very grateful for your support and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.